Hello and welcome to the BYU Library Family History webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on September 7th with Jeremy Minty. He will be giving a presentation entitled, Discovering Your Family in Digital Libraries. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Dave Obie on discoveries in the 1931 Canadian Census. Before we begin, here's a little bit about Dave. Dave is a journalist and genealogical researcher who has written a dozen books and given more than 700 presentations at conferences and seminars in Canada, the US, and Australia since 1997. He is editor and publisher of the Times Colonist Daily Newspaper in Victoria, British Columbia. He has worked as a journalist since 1972 and has been researching family history since, since 1978. In 2012, Dave was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws by the University of Victoria for his work as a historian, genealogist, and journalist. He is also the university's honorary librarian. He was a member of an advisory committee at Library and Archives Canada for four years. Dave is a columnist for Internet Genealogy Magazine and his books include a comprehensive guide to the Canadian census. And we'll now turn the time over to Dave if he's ready. And, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Sorry for the bit of a delay in starting the, the session today. Uh, laptops can sometimes fail you. So I'm on my backup laptop right now. Anyway, the, the, conver the, talk to, the conversation today will be about the 1931 census, which was released uh, in June by Library and Archives Canada. And there's a lot of work is being done on the census by Ancestry and by um, Family Search. Uh, we have a preliminary index done, done with the wonders of AI, similar to what was used for the 1950 census uh, of, the, of the United States. Um, a much better index is coming fairly soon. So uh, I've, I went through, um, in the week between the, the release of the census and the release of the preliminary index, I did my best to find as many people as I possibly could. Uh, in the index or, or in the census, just to see what I could, what I could find using the old-fashioned skills where we had to go through page by page. Uh, my father is shown here. He's the he's the, at the very very bottom. Brian Obi, along with his uh, brothers and sister, and my grandparents in Edmonton, Alberta. That was one of the first things I looked for, and I was quite quite happy to find it. It was easy because I knew the address. I just had to narrow down the address within the Edmonton listings, and off I was. There's uh, information on the census. Rather than a handout, I have information on my CAN Genealogy website. So go to cangenealogy.com and click on the, uh, the, one of the three um, links at the top, the story, the questions that were asked, and research tips. I, the reason I don't have a formal handout is because I'm updating this page all the time as more information comes available to us. And uh, for background, I've written a couple of books, including Counting Canada, which is a guide to the Canadian census. It's the most comprehensive guide available, and it covers, uh, it has information on the 1931 census. It was written before the census was released, so it's not quite as uh, comprehensive with the later censuses, but uh, there's a lot of basic information there, good information that applies to all the censuses. And um, I'll get into some of that towards the end of the conversation today. Ancestry is the one that already has the uh, the preliminary index uh, online. I believe they've locked it down, so now you have to be a member to to have access to it for the first couple of months. Anyone could see it, but it was it was done very very quickly, and I think they did an, did an amazing job. The same as uh, with the 1950 census. The 1931 census will also be available on Library and Archives Canada, as well as Family Search. This is the page uh, from Library and Archives Canada saying that it's coming soon. A lot of information shows up in the census. Uh, there's the hard stats. There's also how people were living. There's also you know, the individuals in your family. There's, there's a lot of really, really cool information to be had in the census. 
And I, I basically beg you, look beyond the names. Look, 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 look at what the people were all about. Try to get background information on it. Try to understand the situation they were living in. Because 1931 was a, a terrible, terrible time in uh, much of Canada because of the Great Depression. Um, but the numbers for a start show population increase. The most provinces were seeing an increase. Um, a couple in the Maritimes were showing a decrease in population. But overall, Canada had 18% more people than it had in 1921. There was also a, a shift into to, towards the west of Canada that's been going on for, for decades um, and into cities. The, the rural population, which had been dominating Canada for so long, was, was pretty much being taken over by urban living. And for the 1921 census, the government hired returned soldiers as enumerators. Um, that, that was after the, uh, the First World War. The people were looking for work, um, and the government hired these returned soldiers. There was another dependable source for, uh, for enumerators in 1931. That was because of the huge unemployment rate that was uh, being felt all across the country. Prevailing unemployment rendered the task of obtaining suitable enumerators much easier than in 1921 because people were desperate to do whatever they could to make some money, and uh, they were willing to work uh, collecting names for the census. A thing to remember about the census is that quite often the people who were doing the census, they weren't experienced at this. This came, came along every 10 years. They might not have been involved in the previous one, so they were learning on the job. That's why you might find some odd things in the census from time to time, some, some information that, that might not be accurate. Um, people were learning on the job. But the census also reflects the problems that the country was having with employment numbers. Um, wage earners age 10 and over, and age 10 was the cutoff uh, shown in the census. That, you know, it's, it seems awfully low today, but that was the cutoff number in the census. Look at, uh, say, British Columbia, where 25% of the wage earners were out of work in 1931. It was worse for male wage earners. The, you know, males were more likely to be unemployed than females. Uh, so again, British Columbia, 27.5%. Uh, unemployed. Canada overall, 18% out of work in 1931, 20.9% um, of the men out of work in 1921, in 1931. The Great Depression uh, led to a lot more questions about employment. Um, why were they unemployed? Uh, the number of weeks they'd been unemployed in the previous 12 months. Um, was it because of no job, illness, accident, strike or lockout, temporary layoff or whatever? And there were several questions uh, about that and several ways that the numbers have been, have been analyzed in the official reports on the census. But it's worth bearing in mind the conditions. Um, if you find, it, find an ancestor who was um, gainfully employed and making a good income in 1931, you're one of the lucky ones. A lot of people were really, really suffering. And I'll show you some examples of that. A critical point in Canadian census research it's the de jure system, not de facto. That means that where people, people are counted where they should be, as opposed to where they actually are. That, and that means it's a judgment call. De facto means whoever was in that house at a certain time that day or that evening, whenever, whenever the cutoff point was, um, they would be counted in that location. De jure is open to interpretation. Um, a, a wife could say that her husband was living in a certain spot. Meanwhile, he was a thousand miles away looking for work. And it gets tricky where, where, it's, uh, where, where, you, where you find out later that the, that the husband had no intention of ever returning. Um, de jure means according to law, people are counted as if they were in their legal re residences, wherever their residences might be. As an example of how that still works today, my daughter taught um, in Japan for a few years and she would be counted as being a resident of Victoria, British Columbia in the census, even though she was not even in the country at the time. Um, just because you find someone doesn't mean they're, they're in Canada or even alive. I found cases of that that actually confused me until I figured out the problem um, because the family back home didn't know that person had died. So as a result, they are counted in the census. Example of some of the work issues. Kamloops, British Columbia, population 6,000 and change. Um, a long, lengthy, lengthy list of drifters at the city soup kitchen. Um, there were 526 men counted at the soup kitchen. 
that means almost 10% and certainly more than 10% of the adults were at the soup kitchen. In some cases, they're shown as being camped at jungles. Those are hobo jungles. That was for people riding the rails. They would gather near near the rail yards somewhere and have, have basically a, an encampment. And we were seeing the evidence of that in the census. It really, like I, all my life, I've known that there, that there were, that um, the Great Depression was a major, major factor in Canadian history. Um, this census really, really hammered at home, seeing actual names of people living in the hobo jungles. It's not just something that appears in books now. It actually, I can see real people there. So far, I found none of my relatives um, in hobo jungles or riding the rails. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I find one someday. The one, one or two people I thought might be candidates for that were reported as living at home. Now, what I said about de jure, it might be that they were actually in a hobo jungle at the time, but the family reported them as being at home. So you're not, it's not definitive in terms of what you'll find. The economy was in shambles. Uh, this is Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Subdistrict 58, uh, riding on freight train, riding on freight train, riding on freight train, an occupation drifter, and shown as a floater. Uh, here are more of them. No fixed place of abode, living in tent, riding on freight train. That's, that was typical of so many, many people in 1931 in Canada. Swift Current, uh, Saskatchewan as well, railroad camp. Um, all of these people were living in the camp. You follow the main lines of the country, across the country, um, look for the major subdivision, subdivision points and you'll find hobo jungles in every single one. Were more children in orphanages? I wondered about that. Would, would families have given up uh, some kids uh, to adoption or if put them into an orphanage on a temporary basis or whatever? Um, so I checked some orphanages just out of curiosity to see what I could find. Uh, this is Indian Head in the, in the Capel District in Saskatchewan. Uh, boys met, mentioned first, girls mentioned later. I've turned this to the side so you can see you know, the Orange Benevolent Society, Protestant Orphanage. I went through a bunch of the names here to see what I could find and then see what I could, who I could compare back to the 1921 census just to get, or the 1926 census out of the prairies, just so I could get a sense of the, of what the conditions were like. And I could identify families that had given up their kids, basically. There were six children named Waldron, um, separated into the girls and the boys because they were on the, on the census, they were listed separately. Maybe a family. I found the family in the 1921 and 1926 censuses. censuses. I, so I had the names of their parents. Um, were they orphans or had they just simply been given up on a temporary basis? Um, here's, here they are in 1921 and in 1926 um, in Saskatchewan. And be very, very careful with census indexes always um, because in this case, the census index has accurately recorded uh, the name of the person towards the bottom there on the, on the 1926 census. But as near as I can tell, his name was Thomas. So why it'd be called Tamil, I don't know. But be very careful about that. The mistake could have been made uh, at any point along the way by the enumerator, by, by, a, by a census index person. Um, could have been a neighbor reporting all this information and they didn't have it accurate. Um, Again, I've got another example further on my own family where I can't figure out the name at all, where it came from. But be careful about that, that kind of thing. Found, I, I went digging through old newspapers to see what I could find about the family. And here is Esmond Walter Waldron uh, dying in 1941. Um, but it refers to the death of his wife uh, in about 1926. So uh, there you have it. They were, they, they, their mother had died and the father um, put them into an orphanage. He probably decided he couldn't handle uh, having having those those all those kids, those six kids. Uh, so it's you know, you wonder what happened after that. Uh, later records show that um, he was with the kids later on in life, so they weren't there permanently. They were just under someone's care for a while. Um, and here he is in the 1931 census. Esmond gave me no results. He's indexed under Emund Waldron. But I certainly did find him, uh, head of the household, and he was shown as a widower. The area they were living in, very, very close to the uh, U.S. border, 
so I found a reference uh, to the family in in Montana. Um, one of the one of the daughters had married uh, someone from Montana, and there's actually information on that marriage license about the situation, where uh, the home record, Orange Benevolent Society, Saskatchewan, Regina, admission date March 9th, nineteen twenty eight. Uh, full information there on when the kids were given up for adoption, which I find again quite quite fascinating. Not related to me. These these were, these were people I picked almost at random. I was trying to find someone in the in the orphanages I could, I could check on. My grandparents, my mother, and my uncle, they show up in the census. They arrived in Canada on the New Amsterdam from Rotterdam to Halifax in December 1928. Asaf, Berta, Delilah, my mother, and Helmut. Um, where were they? Where, did, where would I find them? They were living rough. I knew that for a fact. They, they were not having a, a good time. They, were, they, were, they had no money at the time. Um, one thing I got as a clue uh, years ago was a photograph showing my, my grandparents and my mother in front of a house in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, would that be their house? I don't know. Would they be living in a suite? Would they be living in a shed in the back? I have no idea. They're just shown in front of that house. And the only clue I have, I have only two clues actually, where the snow is. The side of the house that the snow is tells me that the side to the to the um, left above my, my grandmother uh, would be the south side of the house. And the, name, the number on the house, 12528, was also a really, really strong clue because um, how, many, how many streets had, um, had house numbers that high? Uh, there were very, very few. So that was a good clue. But what, what, was it, what were the conditions they were living under? Back to the employment numbers, they were in Alberta. 21% of the people in Alberta were unemployed at the time. In the census reports that I've gone through, the, the, the formal printed reports on the census, uh, lost time from unemployment based on arrival, year of arrival in Canada. They arrived during the worst possible time. You know, the arrivals who came in, in, in that year were most likely to be unemployed. And they were Germans from Russia, they came from Ukraine, they had Polish ancestry. Uh, the racial origin of people, um, you know, cross-reference to the, the number of weeks lost um, by wage earners, et cetera, shows that people from Eastern Europe were, were far more likely to be unemployed. So they had the wrong location, they came at the wrong time and they had the wrong racial origin. So really they were gonna be unemployed. And that really was the story that I had um, through, through the family. They arrived from Ed to Edmonton from Ukraine in 1928. Um, and they, they tried to find work wherever they could. They worked in, in mainly in rural areas around Edmonton. In 1931, my grandfather worked on a variety of farms west of Wetaskiwin, Alberta, which is, Wetaskiwin is about 50 miles uh, south of, uh, of Edmonton. They lived in sheds on those farms. Um, there was, there was, um, I've heard, um, family legend has that they they some, sometimes lived in the barns um, for the for their bathroom. They simply had to use whatever whatever there was where the cattle were going to the bathroom. That's where they went to the bathroom. That kind of thing. It was very very ugly, um, but that's my family history, um, and it makes it fascinating in some ways, but also as a reminder of how far we've come. Anyway, they I had the same the names of some of the farmers because my. My aunt um, had asked my grandmother about 40 years ago, my aunt asked my grandmother for information on what the family was doing. And my grandmother gave her the names of, of farmers where they had lived, including the year 1931. So I had that to go on. I used land records, the 1926 census and local history books to find, to find which area they would be in in 1931. I narrowed it down, if you can call it that, to a fairly large area. Um, that's where I started searching this large, large area be between Wetaskiwin and Pinoka in Alberta, uh, west of the, of the, the old main highway. Um, and finally, using this book, the Pinoka Panorama, which is a, a local history book, I found references to all the families where they'd lived in 1931. And all those people were clustered very, very close together, it made perfect sense uh, that they would all be clustered together because they would have, my grandparents would have walked from one farm to another to get work. 
with the, their two young kids in tow. Um, made perfect sense, also very, very close to the rail line. The railway would have brought them from Edmonton to work in that area. So next I took a, a modern map of, of the Pinoca County and put these little happy faces wherever those, 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 those names showed up. And my thinking was that my, my grandparents would appear on one of these farms. They would be there somewhere. Um, so that was the first thing I looked at when the census was released. I found the location of, of, for, the, for this area, uh, which enumer enumeration district it was under, went through it, and nothing. They were not there. So what do I do now? I went back to the basics and uh, looked at the place in Edmonton again. They had to be somewhere near that. If they weren't down on those farms, had to be somewhere near that. Please, 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 because you know if they're not there, I'm looking for a wide, wide area. Um, but looking for that house, 12528, there weren't many options. In fact, I narrowed it down to three basic choices where, where they, they would be. So I started going to the, to the enumeration districts that included those addresses, knowing they might not be in that specific house, but they might be somewhere around that house. And after a while, I found them. They were living roughly one block south of a house with that number on it. They were in the North Edmonton Hotel paying $8 a month for the room. My grandfather made $90 in the previous year. He was out of work for 35 weeks. And $8 a month for a room, um, work that out by 12 months, that's $96. So he didn't make enough money to even... Uh, uh, and cover the rent on the room in the hotel. It was basically a boarding house type of hotel. Uh, shows um, my, my grandparents there, my mother Delilah was shown as Lillian, and Helmet is shown as Zoo Hunts, and I have absolutely no idea where they would have got that from. But they are correct, he was born in, in the Netherlands as they're waiting for a boat to take them across to Canada. The census is just a starting point. It's more than just a list of names and ages. Do not ignore the information that it offers you and the information that it leads to. Um, I know once I know where they were living, the next logical thing for me to do is find out whatever I possibly could about that hotel and the area that it was in. That's, that's part of my family history. Um, they, I knew the street it was on and you can see right there, uh, Swift Canada, that was a meatpacking plant. One of the largest meatpacking plants in Western Canada was directly across the street from them. And running through the, their backyard was one of the main rail lines. So it was not a, a great place to be, but they could afford it, assuming they had some relief. I was delighted to find this, the, a couple of photographs of the hotel, um, looking, um, looking for any images I could find. This was by far the best one that I found. Sad to say, this is how it looked in 1913. It burned to the ground. And a few months later, they, they had a brick building on the site. And that's the brick building. And that would be the hotel where my grandparents were staying in the 1931 census. Or, or, or they were recorded there in the 1931 census. What was that hotel like? That's the next question to ask. Old newspapers give some indication of what things were like in a hotel like that. I, I, I'm, I've been a journalist for 50 years. I get a kick out of this uh, this. Uh, the first paragraph of this story, not since the days of innocence and the Garden of Eden, Eden has there been found a man with such faith and trust in the integrity of his fellow men, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of first paragraph I would never allow in a newspaper today, but it does get, give you a sense of sort of the, the sarcastic approach that was being taken. Um, basically, there had been, been, been a, a fight in, in the hotel, uh, no witnesses, off, off things, off they were. 1929, the hotel owner was in, in, in court uh, because, um, because of bed bugs in the hotel, given 16 days to improve, uh, improve the premises. There are aerial photographs showing the hotel. This one shows um, where the hotel is in the large circle, the meatpacking plant across the street. And, and to the north on the other side of the railway is that house which I don't believe has any connection to the family beyond that photograph. But the house was crucial to my research because it helped me find the, uh, the location. Other photographs of the uh, hotel and the, uh, the um, um, packing plant. I really get a kick out of this, this, the, or these two photos together. 
because the the the, the building up above with in, circled in red is the is the hotel but you can also see where where the photograph was taken it was taken from the top of that building um um, at the Swift, Swift Packing Plant because the photograph of the building in the foreground or the, the top of the of building in the foreground shows up and you know exactly that it was, you know, the photograph of the hotel was taken from the larger building there. And there is the house that was um, in the photograph that helped me find my people in the census. Now, to be honest, um, I would have found them anyway a week later because they were, they were indexed properly in the census. Uh, that when ancestry released that, but I would rather find it the hard way just to see just to see how it you know I, I get a better sense of the whole the whole area when I'm looking for for things the hard way like that. And um, again, I wanted to race to beat you know beat the index as best I could. Um, other photographs showing them there's the there's the hotel and the and the uh, the house again. Um, the, the entire area where they were living was known as the industrial center of Greater Edmonton. A lot of uh, heavy industry was there, plus the meat packing plants and so on. Um, it is still not one of the better areas of Edmonton, heavy, heavy industry. Um, in 1968, the hotel was uh, made the news again because it was basically a teardown at that point. Um, how much would it cost to repair? 25000 in 1968 was a lot of money. The guy who bought it had this amazing idea of maybe developing a family history center of some sort in that hotel, which I thought really, really kind of brought things together in terms of the, of the research that we do into things like this. So there's that's the Edmonton angle, but there's also my mother's or my grandmother's aunt and uncle who came over, um, Emil and, Hel and, and Helena Tita, um, came from Ukraine to Manitoba in 1926, November 1926. Uh, this is from the passenger lists that are that are available um, on Live and Archives Canada. Uh, name is misspelled on the on the record, but you're, we're used to that by now in genealogy. The actual record uh, shows um, coming from Valenian, which is the area called Valenia. Uh, Valenian is how it was spelled, would be spelled by someone not familiar with, with the word. Um, um, says he's Russian, et cetera, et cetera. He was taken to hospital direct from the ship with something I'd never heard of before. And it turns out it's an infection of the upper layers of the skin. And uh, that, if that had been caught on the other side of the water, it's possible he wouldn't have been allowed into Canada because they were very, very picky about what kind of ail ailments people could have coming into the country. Um, but the 1931 census, they were in the Springfield area east of uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I always like having a map, especially when I'm working on a census, I'll have a map on, on a second screen just to make sure that I'm keeping track of where the area is. Um, the top of the page shows uh, the enumeration subdistrict and then the municipality of Springfield. And then there's the family. I copied that off the what I found online. So it's easy to find a lot of these people and again, the census index that's been done, I would say it's it's probably um, about 98% accurate. There's still some people I can't find though. Um, and I've looked all, I've looked the hard way and waiting for the census, the trouble finding them. Um, there, there, there are, whether, whether I'll find them even after the more formal, more, you know, proofread census index is released, I don't know yet, um, although in a year. Um, another question I had was my great grandfather, William Montgomery, he lived in Vancouver. And uh, this is the house, his house still standing. I took this photo about 10 years ago. Um, he shows up in city directories as a longshoreman. Um, but why? Because in, in 1931, he would have been 71 years old and he was a, he had he had re, he had retired from a farm in Manitoba. He owned a fairly large farm in Manitoba, which he was now renting out. Um, why would he be working as a longshoreman in Vancouver? How, how would a farmer from the Canadian prairies, you know, be suitable as a person working on a as a, as a longshoreman in Vancouver? I for th for years I thought that the census or the directories probably had the had the wrong information. Uh, because it simply didn't make any sense to me. So I was waiting for the census to come out 
to give me a better idea of of what he was doing. I assumed it would say that he was retired, but you never know. And don't make assumptions in genealogy. It doesn't work. 1931 census, uh, when it came out uh, at the start, I, I went you know, by district by district looking for him. Relatively easy to do because you can narrow a district down. And if you can't find someone, when the index is released, you'll be forced to go back in and look page by page. And you'll want to know how to do that. You'll want to know how to narrow down an area to, uh, to make, make your, your, your job easier. Because um, not everyone will be indexed. Uh, that's simply the way it's going to be. That's no index so far has been perfect. Um, fairly easy to, to track down the part of, uh, of Vancouver. I know exactly where the house was. Um, this is from, from a newspaper account showing um, an, an ad showing, showing polling stations in Vancouver for an election in 1928. Um, I did find them relatively quickly in the, in the census. Once I started going page by page, William Montgomery and his wife, Hannah, living on West 23rd Avenue in Vancouver. Um, he's a longshoreman and SFBC was the Shipping Federation of British Columbia. So he really, really was a longshoreman. Um, that was staggering to me. I had no idea that would actually turn out to be the truth. Um, again, it gives me a different idea of, um, of my, my, uh, my, my, my great grandfather. And it shows how much uh, he, um, uh, he made in the previous 12 months and how many weeks he was out of work. I'm not sure it would have mattered too much to, to him because again, he had the rent coming in from the farms, the farmland in, in Manitoba, assuming that people who were farming could still afford to pay the rent. We don't know that. And I checked as well. Um, the reason I check on the enumerator, um, maybe it was a neighbor who gave, inf gave information. Maybe it was someone else who gave information. Maybe the enumerator drew that information out of the city directories or something. Maybe, maybe, William Montgomery wasn't home um, for several days. And so the enumerator had to do something else to get information. Uh, that was my last sort of thought that may, if, if there's any chance that he's not a longshoreman, I'll see what, where the enumerator lived. She lived directly across the street from him. So she would have known him. So she, so I can therefore say, but beyond a shadow of a doubt that she didn't get it wrong. You know, she, you know that he really was a longshoreman at that time. And he retired as a longshoreman, according to the directories at least, when he was 75 years old. A longshoreman is pretty tough work. So I guess he did okay. Some basic thoughts on the census. Um, remember that the census is for the most part oral history or hearsay. Even if you're giving information about yourself, a lot of it you, you don't remember. I don't remember the day I was born, that kind of thing. I, and, and other people will, will not remember things like, like the year they came to Canada. If that's a question asked on a census, they might get it right, might get it wrong. When the 1901 census came out, I was really thrilled to see that the year of immigration was shown there. And for the most part, uh, my family, family members got them wrong. So there's also a lot of hearsay in this. You know, it's what someone else said. Um, so be careful with that kind of thing because you can't really believe everything, you, everything single thing you see in, in any census. Um, it's, it's comes from a variety of sources. They're not direct on the spot sources. It's going back in time and relying on what other people say. It's made worse if the person isn't home and the enumerator goes to the neighbor and asks for information, because that might be very, very, you know, even worse in terms of accuracy. Mistakes happen. People could have been missed. Names or other details could have been misread. Every time information is copied, the chance of errors will increase. Um, I have um, indexed censuses back in the day, and I put one on my website 20 some years ago uh, for Lethbridge, Alberta. And um, over the years that followed, I had four people contact me to say I had their, their ancestors' names wrong. And I went back and looked at it and realized, you know, I could have read that one of two or maybe three or four ways. I read it this way. I should have read it that way. Mistakes happen. Um, Two people can look at it and see different things. Two people can look at it and see the same thing and still get it wrong. So, you know, you have to be very careful. If, if, there's, if, there's, if you can't find your person, try a variety of different searches. Keep on searching for more and more different names to see if something will finally pop up. How might that name have been misread? This one, one question you have to ask. 
indexes are never perfect. Um, and that's, that's a, a basic rule. I, I, I said, I've, I've indexed, I've got things wrong. Um, and every index will have a problem for one form or another. And we can, we can, we can do our best to get it as accurate as possible, but I'm not sure we'll ever achieve that. And that's not no fault of the people doing the indexing. The ancestry index uh, done using a form of artificial intelligence. If you can't find someone there, don't assume they're not in the census. I find I, people say that all the time, how they don't find their person with a basic search. They say my, my ancestor, ancestor was not in the census. That's usually not true. Usually it's just a matter of they're hidden in the census. In the, in the 1916 census for, uh, for Saskatchewan, I could not find my, my, my family. Uh, well, last name is Obi, it's four letters. Uh, how can you miss that? And um, in, in an index, it was indexed as A-H-E-E. -E. So they got the first two letters wrong. 50% of the name was wrong. So uh, they were there, but they were, they were shown incorrectly. It was very badly written in the census. I can see why the mistake was made, um, but they were there. Search with several different search terms. Um, errors in the index, index might inspire your searches. If you see something else that doesn't make sense in the census, that might be a clue as to what to look for to find your own family. Um, search for first names, search for a variety of different names. Um, search for people who, search by the region, search by, uh, by the names of neighbors, if you know that kind of thing. The index will be will be vastly vastly improved um, as time goes on. Um, but as I say, I still can't find two people. I'll keep on looking for them, um, and probably as as I do deeper diving into the census, I'll find that there are more than two people I can't find. The back to my my uh, grandparents, my mother and my uncle. Which names are correct here? Um, there are four names. Well, five names with the surname. They were indexed as, as with an A, not an E in the surname. Um, Asif didn't spell his, his, his name that way. Berta didn't spell her name that way. Delilah, my mother, was not Lillian. And Helmut was not Zuhans, whatever that is. So, you know, not bad. That's, you know, out of five names, zero correct. But you can expect that kind of thing. Looking, looking in the census for Alex and Lydia Gall, other, other relatives of mine, they were shown as Gali. Um, the real mystery is on the next page because they're, you know, Alex and Lydia are at the bottom of one page. You go to the next page, there are they're, they're three kids, Avald, Richard, and Delilah, a second Delilah. And um, they're shown under Schultz. And I can't even figure out why. I don't know where that where, where the, the machinery would have would have come to the logical conclusion that their name was Schultz because they continued the Gall family, which is which was wrong. It was shown as Gali anyway, um, but they clearly should have been continued from the previous page. So where the Schultz came from, who knows? Um, sometimes they're nice, clear printing. Um, it doesn't mean that the people who did the printing can spell, but they're they're really really good at, at penmanship. Um, here's here's Battle River. Look at the spelling of Jacqueline. Look at the spelling of Ludwig. Um, so if you search for the correct name for Ludwig Miller. You're not gonna find, find the, uh, the, the, those, two, those two Ludwigs. If you search for, if you search for, for him, uh, totally, totally misspelled. Misspelled, you know, you know, if you do sort of a backwards search to see how, you see how, how the names are misspelled in the, in the census, he shows up uh, under the most bizarre spelling of Ludwig I've ever seen. And uh, even, even the, the, the um, the, the two the two Ludwigs were indexed differently. One has an N with the second letter, the other has the has a U with a second letter. They look pretty close to me in the handwriting, but whatever. The, I, the machine thought differently. Morden, Manitoba in 1926 and 1931. Uh, um all the Kenet, McKennets in Canada are related in one form or another. Um, and I'm part of the family. Um, on my dad's side, um, fairly straightforward. How could you make any mistakes on names like this? It's 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 easy to get these ones right. Except like in 1926, John McKenmill and Catherine. No, that's not Catherine. Bayward. Uh, that's that's correct. Jay Howard was correct. Isabel became what? 
and Adina. Um, so, so, so basically, John Bayward, J. Howard, and Adina. Those those uh, first names were correct. Uh, Nineteen thirty one. Uh, they did better. Uh, not the way that we spell McKinnett today, but it's varied back and forth over the, over the years. It, what, they did a much better job in 1931. So the machinery was, you know, the software was working better then. But beyond that, what about this one? This this shows up in Morden, Manitoba as well, where the where the McKennets were. Um, maybe it's maybe it's Marguerite McKennett. Um, I saw this before the index went went live. I thought this might be Marguerite McKennett. I can't tell though; it's pretty hard. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, Bay McKennett's wife, Irene Horseman. Um, so I figured that's close there, and and they'd be like two names apart. Yeah, they both were nurses, so maybe maybe it is. Um, comparing the number, the, the names shown on Ancestry when they, when that index went live, uh, seven out of twelve, um, it, which is not bad at all, and they. Ancestry, the machinery, the equipment, the, 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 the software, agrees that that name is McKenna, which um, I'd be a lot happier with if it, if it, if it had a few names that were, um, if, you know, if it, if it was not wrong on other names that we see there. Um, Penn, Saskatchewan. I've, I'm related to a lot, a lot of people in the Penn, Saskatchewan area. This, the connection is way back. The connection is, um, is to a family that I found through DNA matching. Um, our common ancestors were in Kent in England in the 1750s. That's how far back it is for this, for this connection. But during the pandemic, I got fascinated by this thing, by, by this family. I had so many matches, DNA matches for descendants. I figured I'll go through and, and line up as many descendants as I could. And I've got around 3,000 that I've tracked down. And just to show what Pence was like um, in 1922, which is the, the age of this map, um, those are quarter sections that have relatives of mine on them. The, 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 the family sort of moved en masse to south, southern Saskatchewan and got all of these homesteads. So they're going to be in the, in the 1931 census. Great. But look what happens. There is books, Stanley books, and and um, Willard Garner books. And then there's a Brooks further down. The, the name should be Brooks, not books. Um, if you do a search in the 1931 census for uh, in the index for books, you sure enough find a bunch of them. Um, Stanley and Louise, Willard Garner, et cetera. Those are, those are my relatives from the Pence area. They're, they show up in Long Lake, Saskatchewan. So be careful about that kind of thing. But there are ways to sort of you know, do a better job with, with the ancestry, ancestry searching. Um, for example, my, my surname, straightforward, I can search as exact and sounds like, or I can choose other options. I can choose similar and sound X. Um, but the critical thing is that the, when you go to the bottom of that, the little, little, little search box there about these settings, um, click about these settings and you'll find a lot more information about how to do proper searching. Ancestry is giving you these clues for proper searching. Uh, they're, not, they're not calling it search tips, but they're calling it, uh, but there's, they're, they're identifying how things were done, how, how indexing was done. And you'll actually get more information about how to do better searching if you see what they've done and what, what each of the, of the different options will bring you. Exact matches versus sound X versus phonetic variations, that, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do get better results um, the more information like, the, like this that you go for. And also use wild cards, uh, the asterisk and the, and the question mark. Um, see what they mean. A lot of different websites allow wild cards. Ancestry certainly does. Um, you can do more with wild cards. Um, you know, if, if, if a wild card, say, will allow you to ignore a certain letter, that kind of thing. I could use that to deal with my books Brooks problem. Um, it, 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 can, it can solve things quite, quite quickly. But again, it's a matter of learning to see, learn, learning what you can about the, the ancestry um, clues that they're offering you. So trying a wild card, you can have more than one in a word. You need at least three consecutive letters or three letters that do not have to be consecutive. So looking for McKennett, 
but can it quite often the the e is uh, the e the, the e could be an i and the i could be an e, be an e and um the last could be a, could be a T. It could be a single T, or it could be two T's. So by doing this search, I'm capturing a variety of the the variations. Um, so off I go. Find a variety of different uh, different uh, names here um, uh, with, with a with a search for McKennett. Um, when I dive a bit deeper into it, here's one in, in the Saint Vincent de Paul Penitentiary in Quebec. It's shown as Bernard McKennett, which confused me because I've never come across a Bernard in all my McKennett work. I've done, I've collected a lot of McKennett names over the years. I've never found a Bernard, and um, but Saint Paul, Saint Vincent de Paul Penitentiary makes it kind of interesting. But then I call up the actual um, page and I look at the at the image, and that doesn't say McKennett. It's it's more like McKinnon. It's not one of my people. Here's another example. Look at this guy. Where, how would he be uh, be recorded? McRae, uh, Kenneth Eddy, with, along with Alma Louise, Peter Kenneth, and Patricia um, Ann. So his name is Kenneth Eddy McRae. He shows up as Eddy McKennett, and his wife is Alma Louise McKennett, because they somehow ignored the R-A-E and Brought the brought the letters together and, and called it called rather than McCray Kenneth they 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 identified that as McKennett so be careful with that um, so so searching for um, the search I tried before plus the search for McKennett um, you'd think that the results would be would be very very similar given, given what I was working on. Um, I had I had thirty two extra hits that were more false positives by 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 opening it up for more more variations, so be careful about that. Another thing you can do if you're not sure about the the first the first letter of a name, just take it off, put an asterisk in there instead. I'm searching for Liddell, but I, it might be Riddell or it might be Sidell, you know, depending on how it was written. So again, using using the, the wild cards that are available to you, um, you'll have good luck. Now, if you want to find people the hard way, and as, as I say, you, you might have to at some point because you won't, the, send, the index will not give you everyone. Um, narrow down the search as much as you can. Go on Ancestry. It makes it easy to go from page to page. I haven't seen yet what family search will be like. Um, but well, no, I, on Ancestry, I can, by, by going from page to page, I can mean jumping from, you know, say, say 40 pages at a time until I narrow down, until I'm in precisely the area I want to be in. Once I start recognizing addresses or whatever, I can I can search page by page at that point. But if I want to do some some skipping along the way, I can do that that easily. For an example, this is from the, the 1931 uh, census uh, directory of Toronto. Um, most of these people are related to me. Um, I was curious to see what I could find again before the the uh, the main index was released. Um, found locations for for some of these people. And um, then, then more recent um, uh, or, or, or modern, modern, modern maps, like using Google Maps, seeing exactly where the house was, that kind of thing. And here's one, Harvey Obi. Uh, he was, uh, he's shown as Hardy Obi in 1931. Uh, but uh, he certainly, I found him very, very quickly just by going by the, by the, uh, by the address. And he, he was in a enumeration district, district with a lot of people in it. But when I started looking at it, I realized I realized I got to go, I got to go further in here because all the ones that I'm seeing in the in the lower numbered uh, subdistricts, um, they're a long way from him. So I, I skipped to the end of it. I would start looking from the end and work backwards and realize, yeah, I'm really really close to him now because these subdistricts districts are all organized by by um, by area. So once you get close, you, you you slow down, you search a bit more. Um, you can also 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 look for 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 different um, uh, different inter information in other ways. Here here is uh, Saskatchewan, the Regina district, Edenwald um, subdistrict, um, and you can you can then take that the number you find there with with the e copy number um, and search on the on Library and Archives Canada and get to that exact number and then then search through there quite easily easily and quickly from from page to page. 
something to look look at uh, if you if you can't find the region a person should be in uh, is, a, is a site called Scholars Geo Portal. There's a link on my website to that. Um, you can find the boundary files for the 1931 Census of Canada. Be warned, this only matters Ontario and points east. It doesn't help in the west. Uh, but click on where it says add zero slash two, and then um, click to open up the uh, the uh, divisions and subdivisions. In this case here, I've already clicked on the add uh, for the census divisions. Uh, below it, you see what you see. I'm going to click on the census subdivisions uh, tab at that point. The map now shows the, sub, the, the divisions and subdivisions. I can then dive in with a search. I'm looking for Trenton in Ontario. So um, put in Trenton and uh, on, uh, tre the, tre the one in Ontario comes up, click on it, hit zoom there. It takes me right down to, down to Trenton and I can find out exactly what, what uh, region uh, or subdistrict it's in. It's in Hastings, easy to, easy to track down. Uh, locations that way. Um, I want to see what's in the surrounding area. Um, um, look, look a bit further. You know, the, with you see within Hastings, uh, it's the the subdistrict of of, uh, of Sydney. Um, all this is it's just it helps. You know, the, the 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 boundaries are not exact. You know, as you can see, every town has a hexagon boundary. That that's not that's not real, um, but it does get you down into into the rough area. Which is which is very helpful. Finally, a few a few points on on different areas. Um, again, there there are links on my on my link or on my page to some of the printed reports on the census. It's worth taking a look at these things uh, because they they give a lot of information about the background, how how the census was uh, was compiled. Um, in some cases, you know, they 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 the census would have been taken a couple of months ahead of time because the census takers were in an area so far away from civilization, basically. They could be in the middle of the North um, and it could be one trip into that area per year. Um, uh, so they got, they got the best information they could find. Um, be careful with some of the information from the North because it could have been taken two months ahead of time or two months after. Could be that someone gave information in person to the census taker but had died by the time the official date came around. So watch for that kind of thing if you're dealing with a with an area well off the beaten path. And finally, the, the, there was a census, there was a question in the census about radios. Do you own a radio or not? And um, a curious question to have, but radio was new technology. Um, there was an interest in it. Um, but beyond all of that, Canada was requiring people with a radio to have a license for a radio receiving apparatus. Um, and that license continued into the early 1950s. You were required to pay this amount per year for the, for the to, have, to have a license. And there were people who go around with cars with antennas on them, trying to see who has a radio here um, in different parts of, parts of Canada. Um, I find this kind of thing interesting as well, because it simply is giving information about how people lived back in the day. Uh, this this uh, ad for radios came out of a paper in in Ontario in Bradford Ontario. So radios in Canadian households um, by far Ontario had the highest percentage of radios in the country. Um, look at Prince Edward Island, sixteen percent. British Columbia, thirty six percent. That's where most people were out of work, or the highest highest proportion of people out of work. So at least they had something to do with their time. They could listen to the radio. Anyway, um, the information, as I say, is on my on Can Genealogy. There are links there to, to things I've pointed out, such as Scholars Geo Portal and the printed reports. Um, I'm updating that page as more information comes. Um, so if, if you know, check back as time goes on. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for questions or other thoughts or anything? I'm always always interested to hear if if anyone has found other great ways to, to deal with some of this stuff. So um, always looking for more information. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. You hope, we hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on September 7th with Jeremy Minty. He will be giving a presentation entitled Discovering Your Family in Digital Libraries. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website 
thank you, Dave, for his presentation. Have a wonderful week.